So in this section we're going to deal with um, creating a geared mechanism just so we can show you how to put gears on the screen and how to develop them into a bit of a machine. And then we'll use that uh, built up output to show you the output options for uh, the various things that you make. Alright, I'm going to open up the tools menu just by clicking on the tab over here for tools. You can see the screen turns, in my case, a yellowish color to indicate that we're on a tool screen. And now we have a series of buttons here. Uh, the ones that are not lit up are the ones that I have not yet developed. So at the moment we only have circular gears, pulleys, sprockets, and indicators. Uh, let's choose circular and we'll go over the options that are in there. Um, first of all, you can see on the screen uh, that there, uh, the head up in the corner, or well, gear head up here, uh, he indicates that this screen is rotatable, and there's a reason for that which we'll sh uh, see very shortly. Also, text is on the screen on both sides telling us about the gear that we're creating. Uh, down here on the tab itself, we have wheel and pinion, and again, um, in the context of gearotic thoughts, when we talk the wheel, we're talking the left-hand gear, and the pinion will be on the right. That's not actually proper terminology. Uh, in gear terminology, a pinion is the smaller of the two gears, uh, but that would get confusing since you can make either one uh, any size you wish. So we have for each uh, gear the number of teeth, which is obvious. We have shift, stub, and width. Uh, shift is a industry standard uh, coefficient of profile shift. This is one of those settings which if you don't know what it is, uh, you probably don't need it. If you know what it is, then it is available for you. Uh, it's used, and we can have the discussion on uh, on the board, um, it's used to change the mesh characteristics of two gears in order to strengthen or weaken teeth uh, on a particular gear to spread the load, so to speak. Uh, but we can get into that on the form. Stub is if you want a full-size tooth or a shorter tooth. By lowering stub uh, to a number between 0 and 1, that's 0 to 100 percent of the normal height of that particular tooth. Same thing with tooth width. Set to 0.5 and a tooth will be as wide in the tooth as it is in the space. Uh, we also have a checkbox for planetary to uh, make the gears operate in a planetary configuration. And those of you that are familiar with planetaries from Gerotic Motion will notice that these planetaries look a bit different. Um, industry specification for a planetary uh, seems to be that we have a profile shift on the pinion in order to make things mesh up a bit better. Uh, and in this case, uh, they do see that they do appear to work much better. Uh, we'll turn off planetary. We have a left and right hand selection, which for spur gears is unnecessary. Uh, but for helicals and uh, bevel gears, it's important to know whether a gear is left or right-handed. Um, for in the center here, we have a size parameters box, which has our module, pressure angle, and rack fillet, which is a new setting for us. Uh, the rack fillet is the fillet radius on the corner of a rack. It's specified in modules or diametric, uh, uh, diametral pitch ratios. So it's a number from 0 to 1, basically. Um, setting it to 0.5 would give you a half of a uh, module radius. So with a module 5, we'll get a module 2.5 radius. And as you can see, what it does is round out the root. This strengthens the teeth to a certain degree. Uh, there's various reasons a gear maker want to do it, but again, it's one of those settings which if you don't know what it does, you probably don't need to. Uh, and if you want to experiment with it, it is there for you. Um, next, we have the add wheel and add pinion to project. Those are self-explanatory, and those are the buttons we use to add one gear or the other to the project. Now, you'll notice looking at the two gears which are currently on my screen, uh, one has spokes and the other does not. This goes back to that setting on the options page, which is do not spoke a gear less than one inch in radius. Uh, since this gear is large enough, the spokes are shown. The other gear uh, is not yet large enough, so no spokes are shown. If we increase the pinion size, you can see it, it eventually hits a size where it snaps in and gives us spokes. Uh, word on spokes. Uh, at the top of the screen in the spoke box you can select um, the shape of your uh, shaft hole 
you can select your shaft diameter, of course. A boss ratio, which changes this area around uh, the shaft hole. How much, um, how much of a rim will we have around there for shape is the question boss ratio answers. Uh, we have a leg ratio, which controls the thickness of some of the objects in the spoke. Um, leg ratio and uh, rim ratio, uh, rim ratio incidentally is the rim at the outside. Uh, they have different effects on different types of spokes and there's quite a bit more spokes now and more will be appearing. Uh, we have everything from stars uh, to what I call wink balls. Uh, these are just decorative spokes. You'll find that they're much better behaved than they ever were under uh, garotic motion. They'll very rarely give you an error uh, for machining, uh, for example. Um, in addition to the uh, involute gears we have epicycloidal gears these now follow the Swiss clock making standards as closely as I can make them fit uh, you should maintain a wheel and pinion relationship that is to say the second one should be smaller than the first gear in order to match that uh, specification because again uh, the pinions all have rounded leaves uh, according to Swiss spec and you'll notice it's fairly loose fitting gear uh, as befits the fact that it's used uh, to lower uh, friction in the clock. Okay, let's go back to involute uh, teeth and take it to a helical gear. If I press the helical button, you'll see the gears now look a little squashed. And the reason for that, and now the reason why we have uh, Headley's picture up on the screen and allowing rotation is clear, if you rotate the gears, you can now see they are in a 90 degree relationship to each other. The system is showing them to us if we double click uh, with a tilt of 45 degrees automatically so that we can see how they mesh because as you can see the teeth on the gears mesh very well at that angle but it's harder to visualize if you're not at the right angle so the system will automatically create that uh, angle for you uh, so that you can watch a simulation and see how things can form. Uh, these are typical helicals which have grown uh, as a ratio of the uh, cosine of the helical angle. And the reason that a helical grows is because it, uh, it, that's what it takes to maintain the proper tooth structure so that at the right angle the tooth is correct. Uh, if we hit no resize, we will go to what is called the transverse helical method of creating a helical. And now you can see they look very much uh, like ordinary spur gear teeth. Uh, when I bring one straight, it looks like it's spur gear equivalent. This, however, makes them very hard to cut because if you're to cut a helical gear uh, which has not been resized, uh, you have to, by necessity, turn it to an angle uh, thusly, and it's hard to get a cutter which is of that shape because it's a very strange pressure angle when you consider a helical in that transverse plane. So by uh, unchecking no resize, you go back to normal. This is called the normal uh, method of generating a helical, and this is the way most helicals sh uh, should look. The angle between the two, which you can see is 90 degrees in this one, is the sum of the angle on the two uh, gears, and they must be the same angle as well. So if we uh, turn one of the gears left-handed and hit regen, we can now see our picture looks a, a little different and if we tilt it they're in plane which is why they look different but the teeth still look squashed and so on because they have to be viewed from the right angle in order to see the proper uh, pressure angle and involute relationship. Alright let's take it to uh, knuckle gears. Knuckle gears look identical to a helical you won't see the difference until you add them to a project but they are uh, as in GM uh, kind of a a form of helical zero-all gear. Uh, herring bones are the same thing. This will give you a herring bone gear. Nothing changes on this screen because, of course, to the system, uh, they have an identical outline. Bevel gears is where we start to get a little different again. You can see that uh, the gears look a little squashed. That's a hint to you that if you were to turn, uh, you should be able to uh, see a relationship. And as you can see here, it's uh, screwed up. This is not the right relationship. But if you look down at the angles here, we have a shaft angle of 90, but the wheel and pinion are reading zero. This is uh, not the way they should be. You should enter the new shaft angle as 90. The system can then uh, calculate out the proper cone angles between the two gears. And 
Now we can see a proper mesh. Helicals are similar, uh, bevels are similar to helicals in that you have to rotate them to see how they're going to um, mesh to each other and what the relationship is going to be. There's also a selection here for uh, Gleason method. Uh, the Gleason method profile shifts the pinion slightly to allow for a better, uh, cleaner mesh that uh, is not so tight as many uh, bevels are. We also have helical and zero all uh, shapes uh, for the face widths. And um, that will pretty much take care of the types of gears that you can have uh, on this page. Uh, because of the way the system works, you can do some weird things like have epicycloidal bevel gears, and the system will happily create them for you. Uh, so feel free to play around with the various uh, types of things that you can make at that end. Uh, let's take it back to a spur gear so that we can exemplify some of the output stages that we're going to do. Um, I'm going to shift those um, spokes to something more normal that we've dealt with before and I'm going to hit the add wheel to project button. This will put our first gear on the screen. You can see we get a message saying master gear placed. These are timed out messages that appear at the top of the screen. They will scroll off your screen with a slight ticking sound as they go. Um, this is to uh, let you know what's going on. If the system has a warning that it wants to give you or it wants to tell you that it doesn't appear to be finding something you're looking for, those messages will appear at the top of the screen here. Uh, clicking on any gear in the tree will show you the text for that gear and we'll select it in blue. Uh, let's add another gear. To do that we'll go back to the circular gear module. It's already down here on the bottom. It won't go away until you select another tool. This makes it very easy to click back and forth and add more pinions and more gears. To add a gear you simply click on a gear that you want to add it onto or onto a shaft. Here I've clicked the gear um, by using my center wheel of the mouse and so on to rotate, you can see that you can rotate while you're placing a gear and you can sometimes get a better visual feel for where you're putting it. Uh, this red circle is showing you the relative angles involved because sometimes in 3D it's a little hard to tell exactly uh, where you are in, in real space. This, this uh, red line will always come out at zero degrees on the uh, gear in question and we'll uh, roll to the positive angle in red. So you can see here, for example, we're at about 90 degrees or 1.57 rads if we're replacing. Down on the bottom of the screen, you can see it tells us an angle and a distance. The distance in this case, of course, is always equal to the um, center distance between those two gears, which is equal to the sum of their pitch radii. Um, as we go to place it, you can see the angle shows us and we snap at the 180 point, the 90 degree point, and the 0 degree point in order to make it easy uh, to find. So you can see I've placed two gears here on the screen. Simulate will work. And we have a normal transmission. Let's add one or two more for the heck of it. We'll just add that to there. And we'll grab a pinion and very quickly add a pinion onto here. Now, once you have gears on the screen, you can modify things a bit. If you were to click on a gear, and you can see any gear I click will highlight. If I click on this gear, for example, and say move on gear, um, my whole mechanism is now variable, and I can roll it around to reposition things. You'll notice that as a gear rolls, all the other gears have to roll with it in order to maintain integrity to the design that you've been designing throughout it. We'll talk about that more in uh, future videos. So by clicking, we're back into position. Now let's talk about output a little bit and perspective. Um, first off, the perspective box up here, you can see that we have a happy face in the middle, which is a face facing us. It relates to the way Headley's face on the screen uh, deals with the issue of perspective. Right now we're on a front view perspective, which is shown by the fact that Headley's face is facing directly towards you. That makes it a front view perspective. You can always consider that you're looking at something which is directly in front of Headley's face, but 
it's best not to think too much about what's going on with him. He's just there as a visual clue so that as you're centering things, you'll find it easy to recenter back to zero. He's very effective at that. Um, if we hit the sp face in the middle, you can see Headley is now, we're looking at the back of his head, which means we're looking at the gears from the back. If we hit to the side, we can see we're looking at Headley's left side, which means that these gears, the faces that are facing us, are the left side of the gears. Headley's right is the right side of the gears. Looking at the top of Headley's head means we're looking at the top of the gears and similarly bottom is the bottom of the gears. So it's pretty obvious um, exactly what you're looking at. Uh, if you find yourself in a strange screen position like what we're in now, you're going to find by looking at Headley uh, almost anybody can go to center instantly and that's something that uh, most CAD programs you find yourself getting a little lost in. So we're going to stick with Headley for a little bit. Alright, let's talk about output now. We have four buttons up here on the screen and when you hover your mouse over it you'll see them light up and give you a description. The first one is print one to one. This is meant for printing on paper so that you can cut the gears out with a scroll saw or or chisel or uh, however else you want to be brave and cut them out of wood or metal with. Next button over is STL models. This will put out uh, boundary representation models or STLs which uh, are good for 3D printing and such. Then we have DXFs. Uh, the banner on this says 2D DXF, but it will actually put out 2D or a new type of 3D that we're experimenting with. I'll, we may change that over time. We'll let you uh, CAD people deal with the various DXF problems and let us know what you'd like to see. And then of course we have a CNC output module. So let's take a look at the paper one first. I'm going to hit paper. You can see a message on the screen that says please press acquire printer and select objects for display. The reason it's asking us to acquire the printer is so that it knows the size of the pages that is going to print. So you'll notice if I hit acquire printer, a dialog will open up showing you all the printers in your system. Um, you're likely to only have one, maybe two. I'm going to select my laser printer and that's all I have to do and I don't have to do that again until I actually go to print something. Uh, it will remember the numbers that it just got. If we look at the project page and select the gears, um, when you go to project page the tab will, s will automatically switch at the bottom to selected properties. Uh, this is normal. This is just so you can look around and decide what you want to print for example. So we're going to print spur 2. So to do that we go back to the print module which is still at the bottom it again says select object for display so we're gonna click on spur 2 and spur 2 shows up on the screen and this is how it's going to print now if that gear was too large and would take up two pages uh, the system will be showing us two pieces of paper here with registration marks and so on which are guides to uh, help a uh, cutter cut out his uh, match up the papers so that he can cut out his gear. We've added registration marks, we've added crosshairs and the text on this screen also gets put onto the pages. No matter how large a gear is, even if it takes a hundred pieces of paper, this dialog will show you all 100 pieces of paper that it's going to print before you actually print. Uh, you can buffer things up if you hold down your control key you can select multiple objects and you can see down here when I click through my selected list uh, that switches to show me how it's going to look on its piece of paper. You can then hit print object to print the object you have highlighted or you can check the box to print all objects, hit print objects and they'll print as a batch uh, of objects just like GM did in the background. Uh, Erotic Thoughts is now trying to do things in the foreground so you can see what it's doing. So if we were to print that, you would get messages that the uh, print job has been submitted and things would print through. Now, there is no way to close a module. You're in the print module right now. You could go back to the project screen. The print module will stay active at the bottom until such time as you select a different tool. For example, if we selected tools, and then went to circular again for circular gears, the print module is now gone. Uh, it will open up again the next time you select it from the top where it says print one to one. If I hit STL models, you'll notice the screen just switched to our 
project view, we have a yellow screen telling us that we're on a tool, and a message just went off the screen telling us to select objects. So if we select an object, or multiple objects, I'm going to select uh, three of them in this case, uh, down here in the bottom we can select through our objects and we have options. One is to output the currently displayed. So right now I'm on Spur1 for example. If I hit export STL it will export that single file as a three-dimensional uh, model. I can however check output all individually in which case the system will put out three individual STL uh, models that I have from my selections and it'll put out all three automatically. Uh, that's the batch form which Gerotic Motion used to do. But we have a new one called Combine All into a Single STL and you can see what happens now is all three of my gears from the screen are meshed together single color showing they're a monolithic, monolithic STL and the system will put out those three gears as one piece. Uh, we're hoping in the end that we can develop this into a working 3D printer uh, mechanism output so that you could, for example, design five or six gears that run together, make a monolithic STL, put it out as a single file, and then print the mechanism in one fell swoop. Um, that's pretty much it for STLs. STLs are pretty simple and we don't really have to worry about too much other than that. Now if I hit the DXF button, we have a similar interface. We can select multiple gears or a single gear at a time and see what the uh, DXF is going to look like. And you can see now that we're in line drawing because, well, it's a 2D DXF. We can turn on a crosshair in the middle of the shaft and we can turn on a pitch circle which can help sometimes when you're trying to line up gears because any two gears should mesh together with their pitch circles just touching. So that's kind of a, a just a tw an added tool for somebody that's working with DXFs. We also have, however, a 3D DXF output. Um, and what this will do is put out contours of each gear. For example, although this shows as a model, that's not what's going to go into a 3D DXF. Well, it kind of is. What's going to go into the 3D DXF is the all of the teeth shapes, the tooth shapes on both sides as contours and it'll put them both out. So if you load it into a DXF you'll see a series of lines and contours um, rather than STL faces. Uh, the STL does perfectly well for putting out boundary representations so we're going to try to modify the 3D DXF so it puts out um, drawing information which is more useful to those of you who would want to work in a CAD program. So that will take care of DXF. Last thing to look at is CNC. When I select CNC, I get an object again that said select item for uh, CNCing, and I'm shown a picture of my project. My clicker will not click in the screen to select one. Uh, that's a hint that I'm on CNC selection mode, but a further message will be on the screen shortly, probably by the time you get to see a release of this. If we click on a gear, we automatically get taken to our CNC process screen which shows us that we have selected that gear. Uh, the text on the screen updates to show us the width, height, and depth of that particular gear. And on this uh, screen we can now set an origin. We can set a material size if we wish to change it. We have a From Object button which selects a default material block for us which is just big enough to contain the object that we intend to cut in addition to its uh, thickness, width, uh, and height. Uh, we can set a tool number which is the tool number which will be used uh, in the G-code output for the tool changer. We can set a diameter. The tool table, if you push it at the moment, you'll just get a message saying not yet implemented. At the moment you have to enter a tool number and a tool diameter. You can also enter a final depth, depth per pass, spindle speed, feed rate, final pass, safe height, and plunge rate. Um, final pass allows you to get like a final thin pass. Obviously when you're cutting out a gear like this, it's not important. But we're eventually going to get to the point that we can do 3D waterline. And at that point, uh, it will be important sometimes to have a finish pass in order to uh, get a nice finish. You can see over here at the top, uh, we have modality selections. Right now we're on 2.5D profiling. 
If I hit generate paths, you can see our paths have been built. You can see a rapids. The rapids are red, uh, plunge is in yellow. But since the rapid and the plunge both happen at the same place, uh, you'll get a stippled red and yellow to show you that one direction is rapid, the other direction is plunge. It's going down slow and up quick. Um, the purple outline is the actual gear outline itself. That's there simply uh, on this screen. It doesn't come out in your G-code. Uh, and it's there just to show you how your offset uh, is working in terms of your tool. For example, if I change my tool diameter now to 6 and hit Regen, and then back to a flat in perspective, you can see that we've uh, grown quite a bit. But everything looks good, but we've lost our center shaft because a 6 millimeter diameter bit will not fit in the center shaft. No error will be given out in this case. The system will just assume that you don't want to cut that uh, center shaft because you're trying to use too big a bit for it. If I lower this to a 2 millimeter bit and hit Regen, you can now see that I have my center shaft and it's going to be cut in four passes because my depth per pass is set to five millimeters. If I was to set my depth per pass to eight millimeters and hit regen, you can see now that we only have three cuts. First cut, second cut, and then a shorter distance down the third because uh, three times eight would have been 24 and we're only telling it to go 20, so it does that final run. Um, you'll also see on the bottom pass we're actually getting two passes and that's because it has a um, finish pass here of 0.1 millimeter so it did a final cut so make sure your finish pass is set to zero if you don't want to waste time doing finish passes on something like a contour cut at the moment all we have is 2d if we try to select 3d the system will tell us we are incompatible with this object because this type of gear does not have to be cut with a 3D waterline uh, strategy. If we select fourth axis, the system uh, will simply give us a message in the background saying this modality is not yet developed uh, because we have not yet done the fourth axis for erotic thoughts. Uh, the fourth selection is sliced 3D printer output and again that has not yet been developed uh, and the system will not allow you to select it. So at the moment, those are the output options. That's all that you really have. Uh, you can go back to project any time after playing with your CNC. And again, the G-code processing will stay on the screen, and you can select different gears. You will be asked each time you change so that it doesn't uh, uh, redo, uh, it doesn't change the work that you've already done when you don't want it changed. I think that that's pretty much it for uh, the output options. We can obviously talk about them more in depth when the as the development continues on them. Uh, let's look at one final tool option because we've looked at pulleys. We haven't done sprockets, but sprockets are much like a pulley. Um, we also have indicators. On the indicator screen, you'll be presented with three clock hands going at various speeds. Uh, they are actually all moving, but you'd have to zoom in to see the hour and minute hand moving, of course. But this allows you to pick through various pointers that you can now get. Um, and these can all be cut for you as well and put out in G-code and so on. Um, we're going to increase the list of the pointers that you get here as well. Um, and we're interested in any ideas you might have for any fancy type of uh, pointers that you'd like to see appear. So that's it for now. More uh, in upcoming videos as we complete uh, more and more sections of Gerotic Thoughts. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's starting to get very complex and a lot of fun to play with, so we hope you enjoy the next release.